First and foremost, I would like to thank you all today for coming down uh, for this talk. This talk is the 10th series of the FYI, which stands for For Your Ill. Um, today, we are going to uh, have this talk by Dr. Syed Hamid al He came from, uh, he's a professor from the US. Um, the topic is going to be about bagaimana Melayu menjadi Muslim, sejarah dakwah dan hikmahnya. Um, it's going to be presented in English. Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay, so uh, without I, I will stand up and talk so I hope the cameraman is fine uh, with this because it's late in the afternoon, many of you no, are not. quite tired in the whole day class. I'm quite tired myself waiting for my car to get ready, so I'm sorry if I cannot join for dinner later on. I work, I have to go and pick up my car somewhere. But we'll see whether we can make some changes later on. Uh, and I, I thank SPNLS for uh, inviting me here today. Uh, I came here before uh, a few years ago, two years ago. Two years ago, is it? Yeah, to talk to the SP students as well. And I, I always like to talk to uh, polytechnic students because, as you all know, uh, you will go out into the workforce and will have an impact generally on the younger population and also uh, in the Singaporean community in general. So today, uh, we're going to talk about how Malays become Muslim, bagaimana uh, umat Islam atau orang Melayu di dunia Melayu menjadi uh, Muslim. This topic is very important. Why? For a few reasons, but I'm not going to talk about it in detail here today. The latest statistics that we see in Singapore today, the latest statistics in 2010, and of course, they have released uh, the statistics in 2013 as well. Show to us that Malays are increasingly becoming non-Muslim, right? So we can see uh, in the 2010 statistics that at least 1.1 percent within what we call as the Malay community are now categorizing themselves as non-Muslim, which means we have a few thousands amongst the Malays, Malay population who are now leaving their religion. And we need to find out, of course, why they need their religion. But I think we need to also learn from the people of the past on how they managed to bring Malays into the religion of Islam. So it's funny, kalau dulu orang Melayu kalau boleh nak jadi Muslim, sekarang orang Melayu kalau boleh tak nak jadi Muslim anymore. So why is this happening is something that we need to think about. But we need to think about why the people of the past were able to do dakwah in such a creative way, so much so that they can convert now what we see, more than 300 million Malays into Muslim. Mind you, the biggest, and I'm going to talk about it later on, the biggest Muslim population in the world are not the Arabs. People love the Arabs so much, uh, but the Arabs are not the majority in the Muslim world. They are not the Indians, even though you see Indians everywhere. Right? <laughs> Somehow, they say every corner you find a mama shop, that's true. That is half of my own family, I'm half Indian half Arab, uh, but the majority of the population of Muslims in the world are actually in this part of the world. Okay? So I'm going to talk about really the geniuses, I call them the geniuses, the people who spread Islam in this part of the world, I call them genius because they use several strategies that are so powerful that the Malays would want to leave the religion that they had. Leaving religion is not as simple as what we think it is, it is not like switching from uh, Apple phone to Samsung, which you should because Apple phones tend to be uh, very laggy nowadays. Or changing, <coughs> changing your computers uh, from Windows to Mac, which I highly recommend because Mac moves faster. So always have a Samsung phone and a Mac computer. Never have all Mac or all Samsung. Okay? So they did certain things that we need to think about. Now, I just want to start by saying that we live in an age of geniuses. Everyone is a genius nowadays, especially when I teach university students. They are armed, when you talk to them in the lecture room, they are armed with a handphone, with a tablet or an iPad and a computer at the same time. So they don't actually listen to you. They are waiting for their boyfriend to give them a WhatsApp message, their friend to send them a Facebook message and whoever to send them an Instagram all at one time in the one and a half hours that you talk to them. So, they are filled with a lot of information. You talk to people nowadays, to students nowadays, if they don't believe in you, they just Google uh, the thing that you're talking about and they get 15 million hits and they know what to say to you. And I can see that even in my kids. I have six children and each and every one uh, 
now talk or speak or can engage in a way that I couldn't. And we know, you know who this man is? Uh, we know uh, about this guy uh, who is the founder of Facebook. Of course, you know everybody has a Facebook account. And he is a genius in one way or another because he has revolutionized the ways in which we communicate. Whether we like it or not, we need Facebook somehow to send messages. And even if you close it down, somehow you will be activated again to send messages out there. And of course, uh, we cannot forget Mr. Bill Gates, who's still around, and of course, the, the founder of uh, Mac Macintosh, which is, what's his name? Steve? Steve what? Steve Jobs, of course, everybody knows him. So, these are geniuses. They have done a lot of things. They have created a lot of things that have changed how mankind see themselves. So much so that during Ramadan, I've got a shock of my life when I see young people reading the Quran using iPad. I, I mean, I'm seriously traditionally trained. When I went for my Tafis class, uh, my Ustaz was from Manina, very clear, Quran is this book, and you memorize from this book, right? But the kids nowadays, they memorize the Quran using the handphone, using the iPad, and all sorts of uh, electronic gadgets. So things have changed because of these geniuses. And when we want to try and define what a genius is, it's good to take it from Mr. Einstein, who says that, of course, don't have this kind of hair, because it's really terrible. Uh, any intelligent fool can make things bigger, more complex, and more violent. It takes a touch of genius and a lot of courage to move in the opposite direction. So what is a genius? A genius is someone who does not do the conventional thing. And this is in the strength of Islam and in the strength of Muslim da'wah in this part of the world. The people who spread Islam in this part of the world, they were geniuses because they moved in the opposite direction. When people think that it was not possible to convert the Malays, these people came to this part of the world to bring the Malays into the fold of Islam. So, I just want to start with this definition that geniuses are not only the people who found new technologies, Geniuses are also people who are able to change the minds of other people. So if you want to know a genius, a genius is someone who can change your mind completely to abandon the belief that you have to a very new kind of beliefs. You know, so what is a genius? I would define a genius as someone who displays exceptional intellectual and creative abilities, one who uses his or her God-given talents to benefit others, and more importantly, a genius is someone who creates or who brings about positive and wide-ranging changes in society. Jadi kalau kita cakap tentang orang yang pandai, kalau kita cakap tentang orang yang mempunyai pemikiran yang mendalam dan pemikiran yang orang kata mempecah zaman, dia adalah orang yang dapat menggunakan apa yang dianugerahi kepadanya untuk merubah pemikiran masyarakat dan uh, merubah masyarakat ke alam yang baru. So this is the uh, definition of what a genius is. And when we look at the Malay world, you can see the effect of the works of this genius. Mind you, Malays have only become Muslims since the last five to six hundred years. We are young when it comes to becoming Muslim. The Chinese have become Muslim even earlier than us. Chinese were converted to Islam during the time of the Sahaba Rasulullah Wasallam, which is Sa'an Abu Waqas, who went over to China. By the 7th century, Chinese have become Muslim. By the 10th century, Indians have become Muslim. The Africans got Islam earlier on, during the time of Bilal. Bilal is African himself. So we were late when it comes to conversion to Islam. We were enemies, that means we used to pray to, pray to stones and trees. And that's why if you look at Malays today, the first thing that they are scared about are trees. Do you, you realize that? Orang Melayu takut, takut apa? Takut pokok. Kenapa takut pokok? Why are we afraid of trees? <coughs> what is it about trees that we are afraid of? We say they are what? They are what? Kapun. Kutiana. Right? Kutiana like to play the trees. The trees have spirits. All these beliefs, especially the beliefs of Puntiana, which is just behind you, I think. No, just joking that. Um, <laughs> I think it's like all this good, uh, belief about ghosts, especially the belief of ghosts, is not in Islam. In Islam, there is no concept of hantu, 
This concept hantu, the word hantu is not even a Sanskrit word. It is a word that came prior to the Hindu Buddhist period. It is a belief that we had 35,000 years ago. And until today, we still believe. And until today, we still believe that when someone dies, what happened? What? Roh. They are going to after how many days? After 7 days, after 40 days, after 100 days. Karun marun, but we still believe. Because we were enemies for 35,000 years, and then we became Buddhist. And Buddhism is so strong in our minds, so much so that we cannot take out certain words from the Buddhist past, such as sembah, yeah, we want to use solat. Pua, se, puasa bukan uh, Arabic. Puasa is sunscreen. When the Arabs call it, saung, right? And tu, tu apa? Tuhan, we use Tuhan. This is a Sanskrit word. So in terms of ibadah, we still use a lot of Sanskrit Hindu Buddhist word because we were Hindus for a long time, or you guys were Hindus for a long time. My Indian side, because they're Hindus all the way, right? Sometimes even until today. And you can see, especially in Malay weddings, when you get married later on, suddenly you will become Buddhist. Wow, how do you become, sorry, suddenly you become Hindu. How do you become Hindu? Not Hindu in terms of belief, but Hindu in terms of culture. What is the first Hindu thing that you would do? In marriage? Hena. What? Hena. Ah, the top. Hena. You are happy. Kamla, kena kahwin. Tapi tak tahu kan? It's a Hindu thing. And then you will go up on the on the plumbing. There is no plumbing in Islam. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam never prayed. I never married on the plumbing. This is Hindu past that we got. And then we become Muslim from the 14th century. Some people say that we have become Muslim even prior to for the 14th century, but really the process of Islamization came the 14th century onwards. So, do not be alarmed when you see that Malays still hold on to a lot of the past beliefs that they had. Alright? No matter how Islamic they are, even Ustaz-Ustaz pun takut Putiana. I don't, I don't understand. Right? Takutlah dalam ulaman nanti Putiana datang. This is beliefs that are not in Islam, but we still have Okay? Alright, so I just want to show you some statistics just to be proud of the fact that you are Malay and do not try to be Indian or Arab because Malays are the majority as you can see. Uh, Indonesia is 203 million. Uh, even Pakistanis, Indians, Bangladeshi cannot beat the number of Malay Muslims around the world. You are the largest group of people. I would love to be a Malay, but I don't know why Malays try as much as possible to look Arab or to look Indian. We want to be Bollywood and everything else. So be proud of the fact that you are Malay and be proud of the fact that you are the largest group of Muslims all over the world. And uh, we need to ask the, the, the simple question how did Southeast Asians or Malays become the largest Muslim population in the world? The answer, and which I'm going to present to you today, is through the work of five types of geniuses. And we're going to talk about who these geniuses are. And these geniuses consist of Indians, Arabs, Persians, Chinese, and Malays. The Chinese also came to this part of the world, orang orang China daripada Yunnan dan Xinjiang. Mereka datang ke sini untuk menyebar Islam kepada orang orang Islam di sini. And sometimes when you go to Malaysia, Malaysians they don't want to accept this point that Chinese were the ones who spread Islam in this part of the world, especially in the place called Demak in Java. How many of you here are Javanese? Put up your hands. Okay. How many Boyanis? Okay. Uh, how many Bugis? Bugis? Okay, dangerous people. Uh, how many Minangkabaus? How many Minangkabaus? How many Orang Minang? You are Orang Minang? Okay, they, they are people who like to talk and who are very eloquent. And the rest, what is your identity? You are Pakistani, eh? Yeah, Pakistani, okay. Uh, who's Melayu, just Melayu? Don't know. Who tak, uh, Banjar, who's Banjar? Okay, Banjar, they are businessman. And who is, I don't know what I am. <laughs> <laughs> oh, many, yeah. So, every single ethnic group, when they were converted to Islam, they became powerful Muslims, and they helped to spread their religion. 
the last group of Malays that were converted to Islam were the who were the hardest to convert to Islam? Wap Jawa. They were the most resistant to accept Islam. And I'm going to talk about this later a bit. Why? And when they became Muslim, and this is the thing about the Javanese, they were the hardest to convert to Islam, but when they became Muslim, they became the strongest propagators of Islam in the region. So let's look at these uh, geniuses. Are you all still with me? Uh, am I in your head? Now, I'm your head and not to come out, right? Until you go home today, okay? Like Indiana, right? Okay, and they built a flourishing civilization. Now we're going to start with the culture genius, or if you want to say it in Malay, uh, orang yang pandai mem mem merubah keadaan satu masyarakat menggunakan dengan menggunakan budaya. So these are the culture vultures, but they are dummies, and this is the beautiful thing about Islam. That Islam do not only spread by I'm telling you to become Muslim. Oh brother, why don't you become Muslim now? Right? You know, they use culture. And this is the first way by which Malays became Muslim. Now the culture genius, when they came to this part of the world, they saw that Malays were too steep in their culture. Even 700 years ago, Malays were good in sports. They don't play marbles or, or computer games. But they were expert sailors. Young Malay kids would play a lot of uh, hand sports. And when these people from Arabia, from India, from Persia, when they came to this part of the world, they saw that Malays love entertainment. They like wayang kulit, which is an older version of movies now. So if now you like to watch Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, right? In the past, they like to watch wayang kulit. Now you see people liking or loving Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. How do you use Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles to convert them to Islam? How? How do you use Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles to convert them to Islam? Or movies? You come up with Teenage Mutant Ninja Ustans. Right? Hear <laughs> me in my book. So this culture genius, they saw that it is pointless to tell the Malays do not love entertainment at all. It is pointless to tell the Malays to not love sports. Jadi mereka selain daripada cuba merubah secara radikal keadaan orang Melayu, mereka gunakan cara yang lebih halus dan lebih lembut. So they use the culture of the Malays to change the Malays. So this is what the culture genius did. They explain Islam through the wayang kulit. Rather than telling the Malays, hey, why you go and go this wayang kulit? Haram. <laughs> right? Stop and get into proper Islam. They said, no. Continue your wayang kulit. But these preachers from Arabia, from Persia, after having learned the Malay language, they use the wayang kulit to spread Islam. And what do they do? Using the Wayang Kulit, they change the stories of the Hindu heroes into the stories of Prophet Muhammad, the stories of the various prophets, and the stories of the various scholars in Islam. During a Wayang Kulit session, together with a song, where Malays love to watch, at the end of every Wayang Kulit session, these culture genius, these preachers of Islam will tell everybody, Marilah kita membaca kalima sodok. What's kalima sodok? What's kalima sodok? The people who are there also do. Apa ini kalima sodok? What is kalima sodok? Kalima sodok is kalima shahada. But they make it sound like a Japanese word. And then the Wayang Kulit characters will read Ashadu Allah ilaha illallah Wa ashadu anna muhammad rasulullah Semua baca Everybody watch read And they became Muslim That's how you convert the Malays Teenage Mutant Ninja Ustaz The end of the movie Let's read the Kalimah Shahadim <laughs> You can get this 
fun word is. No, so they use, they use this medium, and this is why they are so powerful. After the Arabs have converted the Malays, the Malay missionaries or the Malay dais use this wayang kulit on the Malays, and slowly and slowly and slowly, Malays became Muslim. So this is one way to spread Islam that we can get. How do we bring the young people to Islam? You use culture, right? And they don't only use the wayang kulit, they use other cultural means to change the Malays, and one of the cultures that they change in the Malay society is the culture of modesty. There is a joke in one part of Indonesia. Before Islam came to the Malay world, Malay women were bare bodied. Do you know that? What bare said? They were bare bodied, especially the, the orang laut, they were bare bodied. When Islam came, of course, other parts they wear clothes, but when Islam came, generally Malay women wear until here, right? When Islam first came, after a few hundred years, it became here. After a few more hundred years, it became like this. So that is a joke. Sebelum apabila Islam sampai kita baru gini, selepas berapa ratus tahun kita gini, dan sekarang kita gini, right? So the the change was slow, but it was progressive through culture, to, through dress, and through fashion. And this is something that we can learn. You want to change people, you don't have to be direct about it. <coughs> Show to them how cool you can be without sacrificing the principles of Islam. So that's the first thing, without the genius. And uh, this Wali Somo, Wali Sbilan, they are part of this culture genius. You hear a lot of the story, and how many of you know about the Wali Somo? You hear a lot of magical stories about the Wali Songo, right? They can fly, the cucu batu jadi air, the pegang kota jadi makanan, all these cerita tambah-tambah lah, nasi kambang, right? Actually, what they did was with the simple stuff, spreading Islam through culture, spreading Islam through writing, and spreading Islam through showing a good example. In fact, one of the reasons why Malays came to Islam is was simply because when they see these people coming from Arabia, coming from India, they were struck by the fact that Muslims are such a clean people. Cleanliness is just one thing that can change people's hearts. If you are prim and proper, people look at you, oh, this is what Islam is. And that's why I always tell the guys, jangan seleki, dan seleki. Right? Be prim and proper, because you bring Islam with you. Well, the girls are having a good time now, eh? <laughs> <laughs> so that's the culture genius, and then the entrepreneurial genius, that means the people who spread Islam through business. And these are powerful people. These are people who tell the Malays, if you become Muslim, I will show you how to make money. Right? Now you go on Facebook, there's this group called Galaxy Trio. They are doing the letak macam apa, macam kipas, nak buat duit tau sekarang. They are not spreading Islam, they are just spreading uh, how money making uh, so called programs. But these people, they came to this part of the world, they spread Islam through business. They sell goods to the place, and when they are selling goods, they also introduce Islam. Malays in the past were powerful businessmen, especially the Bugis, the Binaks and the Banjaris. They were powerful businessmen. And when they saw the Arabs, the Persians and the Chinese could do better business, the Chinese Muslims especially, they wanted to learn from them. As they learned business tricks from them, these entrepreneurial genius took the opportunity to explain about their religion and show them new trade routes. And one of the most important things that this entrepreneurial genius did, this businessman did, was to come to this part of the world and make sure you marry the Malay woman here. Which happened to my tribe, the Aljunaids, the Al Sagaf, the Al Kaf, the people from Hadramaut. By the time they come to the Malay world, the first thing they would do is to marry a Malay woman. Right? Because Malay women are generally quite pretty uh, to us. Uh, and because when they marry into the Malay society, they also get business connections. Because they have business, so called, they want to uh, expand their business network. 
as they marry, and as you know, I mean, as you can see from me, Arabs, when they get married, they don't get one or two children, they get really a lot of children. My grandfather had 25, his grandfather might have like 75, I don't know, <laughs> but there were a lot of them. Eh? There's so many, we don't keep count. Okay, but marriage and business links help to spread Islam very, very rapidly. So, if you are not a culture vulture person, one way to spread Islam is to do good business. Because when you are a successful businessman or businesswoman, you carry the life of Islam with you as well. And this is the other thing we can learn from the Dangi of the Prophet. <laughs> and you can see this is one of the, these are the tributes. These people who make business uh, in this part of the world, they came from China, they came from India, they came from Arabia, and some also came from uh, Africa to India and then to this part of the world. And that, that's why you can see when you look at Malays, they are of different looks, correct? Some Malays look very Chinese, like that brother there over here. Some Malays look very uh, Japanese, actually. Some Malays look a little bit Indian, are you Indian? Black? Okay, you're Indian, so not bad, right? Some Malays look a bit African as well. Have you seen Malay people with like rambut? Uh, bulat -bulat, sometimes they are from Africa, but they don't know, okay? But don't go to that Malay person and say, Are you from Zimbabwe? <laughs> Uh, but because all these missionaries came from all parts of the world, they came to the Malay world, they spread business and then they intermarried with this part of the world. So we have the culture genius, we have the entrepreneur genius. The third genius is the spiritual genius. These are people, these are the Sufis, who saw that the Malays were holding on to many kinds of beliefs. These Sufis, when they come to this part of the world, they had a shock of their life. Why they had a shock of their life? Because Malays believe in so many, many ghosts. Chinese ghosts, how many Chinese ghosts are there? How many Chinese ghosts? There's one. They call it Kui. Bukan Kui Luma, Kui Pisang, but the word is Kui. Indians, how many kinds of ghosts? Indians have no real conception of ghosts. Right? There's no real conception of ghosts. There's only conception of spirit. Orang Putih, or Europeans, how many ghosts do they have? Vampire. What? They are vampire. Dracula and what? Zombie. Zombies. Malays, according to research that I have done, have 55 kinds <laughs> From Hantu Laut to Hantu Tana to Puntiana to Toyo, Polo, and my favorite Hantu Titi. I cannot say that. <laughs> kinds of books. So these people, these Sufis, when they, they come to this part, don't get distracted by whatever, by the ghosts, okay? When they come to this part of the world, they know that Malays believe in so many kinds of superstition. Everything to them had a superstitious thing attached to it. And like I said just now, until today we are superstitious. Right? We are superstitious about a lot of things. Buka pintu, Imam, kenapa basok? Allah. <laughs> Tadi aku demam Oh, macam mana boleh demam tu? Eh? I, I feel feverish Okay, somebody have sent a rocket <laughs> Yesterday cannot sleep Wah, ada benda kacau uh, We are very superstitious Because this are belief that we have inherited The spiritual genius, the Sufis When they came to this part of the world They say, okay, don't tell the place to get rid of the superstition But introduce a more proper idea Of what beliefs should be so what the Sufis did was to tell, was to inculcate the idea of the one God. Malays used to believe in many gods. The spiritual genius that the Malays do not believe in banyak Tuhan. Percayalah dengan Tuhan yang Esa. Esa pun is not an Arabic word, it's actually a Sanskrit word. And Malays believe in Tauhid through them. Right? Simplify the Malay minds. And that simplified the Malay mind, simplicity led to focus and the end of the culture of accents. When you believe in one God, your mind becomes directed to one thing. When you can direct your mind to one thing, you become focused and you can do a lot of things in your life. And this is what the, the spiritual genius did. 
focus the Malay mind on the belief in Tauhid, on the belief in unity. And that's why in the Quran, it is quite clear in Surah Luqman, Allah says, Inna shirka ya bunaya la tushrik billah, inna shirka la dhulmun azim. So Luqman says to his son, do not shirk, do not do shirk to Allah because when you do shirk to Allah, you will be in zulum, which means you will be in darkness. So Malays were in darkness when the, the, the missionaries made them think about the Tawheed, shirk is gone, they become powerful. But nowadays we are developing this shirk again and again. And we need to remind ourselves again about this. And they remove the worship of ancestors. Malays like to worship their ancestors. That's why I began just now. They believe that their ancestors is at home. Until today, someone dies, oh aku nampak datuk datang balik rumah tengah minum kopi. Hanya dekat dapur. All these kind of stories, karut marut, these are just our imagination but we believe in it. And the people in the past, even though they set up keramat, you all know what keramat is, right? Keramat, you know? The Sufis in the past, which were my own forefathers, they didn't tell the Malays to worship this Kramat. They, were, they set up this Kramat so that Malays would go there and remember the deeds of these people and follow in their path. That is the purpose of the Kramat. You do not go to the Kramat and worship the Kramat. And nowadays people forget that. So the Hadramis especially, they emphasize on praying for the people who are dead, who are saints, but following in their footsteps. We forget that sometimes. So, what about Ikraman, Minta Ni, Minta Nobu, I brought my students to Ikraman, I mean, no, this group of Hindu people, they came, uh, one number from the Ikraman, of course, they get their numbers in the end. So, these are some beliefs that we somehow forget. Along the way. So, this is what the spiritual genius did, and one of the greatest achievements that he had in Singapore is, that is to set up Ikraman Habib No. Habib No himself, was a kind of a spiritual genius. He managed to convert people, he managed to change society through the, the, the spiritual uh, acumen or the spiritual strength that he had. Right? And then as the intellectual genius, these are intellectuals or smart people who came to this part of the world. They saw when they came to this part of the world that the Malays are not stupid people. The Malays were very intelligent people. So, and they saw that Malays have a strong idea of what philosophy and, and, and religion is all about. So when Islam came, they added another source of knowledge to the Malays. What they did was, instead of trying to tell the Malays that their ways of thinking is inferior, these missionaries say, your way of thinking is superior, but we need to make it more superior by changing your language. So one of the hallmark of the spread of Islam in this part of the world is that the language of the Malays was changed from Sanskrit to, to Arabic. So a lot of Malay words became Arabites. And when you change the language, you also change the thinking. They didn't only change the language, they changed the, the writing from the <coughs> The Pali way of writing, Sanskrit, they change it to Jawi. And that's why in the past, Malays could read the Quran, they already had the Quran every month. Because they read Jawi every day, when you read the Quran, it's easy to read. We read the Roman words every day, when you read the Quran, because we're not used to the, to the script. And the new language that Malays were given or Malays were introduced to incorporated Arabic, Persian, Sanskrit and Old Malay and because of that, Malays became intellectuals. By the 16th century, the Pondoks, the Pondok is like a kind of madrasa that was established in this part of the world, became like universities where people from the Arab world would come to this part of the world to study. And the scholars from this part of the world became teachers in the Arab world. When I tell Malays this, they don't believe. Oh, cannot be what? They go to uh, Arab countries and teach Arabs. No. There's this man, his name is Sheikh Ahmad Khatib. I want you to go and Google his name when you have time. Sheikh Ahmad Khatib. He was a Malay scholar from this part of the world who was teaching the Arabs in Mecca. He was teaching the Arabs in Mecca. And his Arabic was so good that the Arabs have to learn Arabic also 
from him. So the spread of Islam, this intellectual genius, made the Malays even better intellectuals. And you can see the effect of this in Malay language. All these words are actually Arabic words, but they become Malayized. So abjad, ahli, ahad, askar, akal, dakwa, dunya, had, hal, haram, kisa. All these are Arabic words, but we have made it into part of the Malay language. Huruf ilmu Jawa, kamus keramat korban, makmal, masjid muflis, miskin gulu, roh dan akal. The Arabs introduced to the Malays the idea of the akal. Before that, the Malays do not know what akal is. And the other word is fikir. Fikir. Fikra fikir. And teach the Malays, you must fikir, you must think, you must use your reason. Your, your, your reason. And then bring about a very scientific way of thinking amongst the Malays. Malays became powerful because of the introdu introduction of this thing. One word that the Arabs didn't manage to remove from the Malay is mati and makan. And that's why until today, every Friday night, Malays will makan sampai mati. Right? <laughs> and yes, it's a bad, bad habit. Right? Whenever they reach my age, 38 years old, Malay men will be double the size and Malay women will be proud triple the size. <laughs> because makan and mati have not been taken up. So we need to do something to remove the makan and mati. Okay, so this are you can see uh, Jawi. I'm sure how many of you here can read Jawi? Oh my god. <laughs> so we have a crisis here. Right? At least my generation, we were made to learn uh, Islam by reading Jawi books. We can still read, even though it may be a bit slow, but we can still do it somehow. The new generation, they cannot even read it at all. I make sure that my kids can at least read uh, Jawi. And in, in Arabic, there are 35 letters, sorry, 34 letters. In Jawi, there are 37 letters because the Arabs don't have words like per, ger, cher. Eh, Arab tak boleh cakap cher. Kita Arab tu say cher, they don't know how to. And ger, a ger they can come up, but they cannot say per. Right? Uh, because they, they only have fa, f. Malays cannot say F, they like to say P. So Fatima jadi Fatima. Yeah? Uh, and Yusuf, my son, jadi Yusuf. So they don't like F, they like P. Okay? So they can use And these are some of the texts. Uh, Malays wrote these texts. These are actually medical manuals. Malays were experts in medicine. All kinds of sickness they had the medicines for it. We could, they call it jumpy, but actually this jumpy came together with knowledge of science. They can make people be cured through many of their medicinal practices. And last but not least, I just want to end here, and we have some questions and answers. The visionary genius, these are kings, advisors, and administrators in the Malay world who accepted Islam, and then they sent out missionaries to other parts of Southeast Asia. Islam, in this part of the world wouldn't have been spread so fast without the kings and the queens sending out more Malays to, to tell people to come to Islam. And we know that not only men were rulers, <coughs> women were rulers, and if you have time, do check out the history of Patani. In Patani, in southern Thailand, the women were powerful, so much so that they became queens, who helped to spread Islam and they have very unique names. Orang Melayu dia tak suka kecoh-kecoh. Nama orang, what are the names of this queen? Raja Hijau, Raja Biru, Raja Ungu, and Raja Ungu. Yeah? Simple. Tak payah Fatima, Lomor, Lomor, Malasari. Sekarang semua nama nak hebat-hebat kan? Uh, no, no Sahara, Rose lah, whatever. Hijau, Hijau, Kuning, Biru, Ungu. Easy. Simple names, but they achieve so much in their lifetime to spread Islam in Patani. Now, I just want to add, what have these geniuses taught us? And this, I think, is the most important thing. There are many useful lessons that we can learn from these five geniuses that spread Islam to the Malay world. The first is that they teach us the value of awareness. They were very sensitive and in touch with the developments around them. They were aware 
of their environment. So if you want to share people about Islam, you must do research about the environment around you. What do the people want? What do they like? What are their needs? What are their wants? They were very, they were people who were very sensitive on the people around them, and they made alliances. No genius walk alone. <coughs> Only Liverpool will walk alone, right? Geniuses, actually they say you never walk alone, but they always do, right? Our geniuses will always draw from one another. They supported one another to spread Islam, and this is something you need to remember whenever you want to do something good, never do it alone, because you will fail when you do it alone. They always come in the jama'ah, they always do things together. The other thing that we can learn is that they are very creative, they were very innovative, they use Islam, they spread Islam in so many different ways, from using music to marriage. They were very courageous, many of them left their hometowns to come to this part of the world. The Hadramis, when you read the history of the Arab Hadramis, many of them died in the seas just to, be, just to come to this part of the world. So many of them, even the Sufis, the scholars, on their way to spread Islam, they died. Uh, or because of problems in the seas or whatever, right? They had courage, they were not afraid to try out new strategies and they traveled far and wide to tell the world about Islam. And more importantly, the genius were very committed. They were not good in everything, but they did one thing and they were the best in it. And this is the thing, the last point that I want you to remember. If you want, and I think I've said it before the last time when I came here, if you want to be successful in life, always be good, always know everything of something and something of everything. Can you remember that? Always know everything of something and something of everything which means you must be specialized do not try ever to be the jack of all trades and the master of none what the genius taught us is that they decide on doing one thing and they become so so good in it so much so that they could change the people around them and you can see that i begin with mark zuckerberg and we read about his story, it became a movie. Uh, he was just good in doing computer programming. The same is it with Bill Gates, the same is it with uh, Steve Jobs as well. They did one thing and they did it right, they did it good. And this is something you need to remember in your life. Do not change and do things, uh, do this and then want to change to do that and then want to change to do that. You will never achieve a breakthrough. So I'm not just going to end here. We have about 20 minutes for questions and answers. Thank you very much. Salam.